uh, especially Professor Ani Rai, sir, to give me an opportunity to come to QICT once more. Last year also I was here. Um, um, it's uh, it's really impressive how QICT has um, managed to call so many researchers from all the world for giving talks, and I'm really glad to be a part of it. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to speak about uh, continuous variable quantum optics, the essential tools of it actually. And it's going to be roughly, I think, uh, a two hour tutorial session. Um, but uh, I'll be pausing every once in a while to take up questions and not uh, be distracted from my flow. So I'll be pausing like every 10 to 15 minutes uh, for taking questions. But then you're also welcome to um, just uh, pause me whenever you feel like if you have a question questions or we can also take questions afterwards um so i i was trying really hard to animate um the content but it was difficult because a lot of equations and a lot of maths so you have to bear with me with the overwhelming amount of information that you will see on the screen because there will be maths uh so yeah it will be nice if you could focus on you know where my pointer is so that you don't get you know distracted with the other maths um, scattered throughout the page. Um, okay, so uh, why did I choose this topic of continuous variable quantum optics? The main reason being that um, continuous variable quantum states, they exist almost in all the quantum technology laboratories. You talk about superconducting qubits lab, you talk about ion traps, you talk about uh, photonics, they are omnipresent. For example, vacuum states, coherent states, you can't bypass these states. They will be there in one form or the other form in your lab. And these convenient variable states, in other words, uh, Gaussian states, we'll come to it, are the most easily and routinely generated states in lab. If you talk to experimentalists, then they would say that these are the states that are very routinely generated in labs. And there is a reason it is important that uh, when we are dealing with quantum tech, we should have a fair knowledge of uh, continuous variable quantum optics. So today will be an attempt to essentially show you um, the bits of it. By bits, I mean the states and the operations in continuous variable quantum optics. The states and the operations are all Gaussian in nature, and that is the beauty of it. And we already know how to study Gaussian statistics. And that's the reason why studying these Gaussian states and Gaussian operations, as you can see my pointer now, uh, have evolved quite a bit, as you will see through the slides. So as an outline, I have written here a few topics. First, we'll see the difference between classical and quantum phase space, which is the position in quantum space. Then we'll see what is, um, mode operator and what is a quadrature operator. Then we'll see the displacement vector and the covariance matrix of a quantum state, which are essentially the two tools that uh, um, sufficiently define a quantum state, a CV quantum state. Um, and once we know the two, Gaussian, uh, sorry, displacement vector and covariance matrix, then we'll look at Gaussian states and Gaussian operations. So the bulk of the talk will be again focusing on Gaussian states and Gaussian operation. And finally, I'll leave you with, um, uh, with, with one slide where, where you will see that this continuous variable states and operations are indeed a powerful toolkit for uh, realizing quantum computation, and which, which comes by the name of continuous variable quantum computation. And recently in last year, in 2022, there was a paper from the company Xanadu where they demonstrated quantum advantage using continuous variable quantum optics. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. So let me jump to my first slide then. Uh, yes. Okay. So again, there's a lot of information, but uh, let's go one step uh, at a time. So phase space description. Phase space description is not something very unique to quantum, because even with classical systems, we try to locate the position and momentum of uh, particles in the phase space. 
But the difference is when we are talking about a classical system in the phase space, that is the position and momentum space, we precisely know the locations of those. So I, I precisely know where exactly the axis and I precisely know where exactly the fields. So I know the position and momentum of a classical particle with 100% um, probability, let's say. The moment we go to quantum real, we are stopped by this Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay, so it sets a limit that we cannot know the position and momentum to, to maximum accuracy simultaneously. Okay, so if we are looking at them simultaneously, then there is some inaccuracy which bounds us. And because of that inaccuracy, the state that you will represent over a quantum phase space, it would be a blob, right? You can see it here. This is a blob and not a point. And this blob indicates that you have a certain width in x direction and you have a certain width in p direction. So these are this delta x and delta p. So you have a noise associated with your x value and you have a noise associated with your p value. So this noise are this is delta x and delta p. But then you can have a center of that blob, right? And that center would correspond to the mean value. Okay, so this expectation value or mean value of x, and similarly the mean value of p here. But about that mean, you have a deviation, right? We often quantify that using standard deviation and variance, etc. But essentially, the whole point is when we go from classical system to a quantum system, the phase space slightly changes. Now, in our phase space, we have a we have a blob-like structure rather than a point-like structure to to represent a state. Um, two examples being vacuum state and coherent state. So for vacuum state, if you see the uh, phase space picture, we know that for a vacuum state, the mean value of the position and momentum are zero. Okay, That's why the center of the state must lie uh, at the center of the x coordinate space, just like you see here. But then there is a blob surrounding it because of the uncertainty that is shown to us by the Heisenberg limit. And you have this uncertainty then in x direction and in p direction. So you have essentially a blob uh, at the origin. So this defines your vacuum state. For a coherent state, it is not going to be in the uh, center or at the origin because the mean value of x and the mean value of p are now non zero values. Okay, so for coherent state, the mean value of x and the mean value of p are non zero, and that's the reason it has to be somewhere else. So I just put it here. But they still need to satisfy the Heisenberg criteria of delta x, delta p equals to 1 by 2. So the essential difference between vacuum state and a coherent state is that your coherent state and vacuum state both share the same amount of noise, but Coherent state is displaced from this origin, while vacuum state stays in the origin. A coherent state is displaced from this origin, and why it is displaced and how it is displaced, we'll see that later in this session. Then, an essential tool, a very essential tool indeed, in continuous variable quantum optics is the Wigner function, which is often denoted as W of X and P. X and P are again your position and momentum. So, the idea of Wigner function for this quantum phase space is that we are usually familiar with psi of x, the function psi of x, which is plotted against the position value x, right? So you would have seen that there's x-axis, which in which you plot the plot the value of x, and then the y-axis you plot your value of psi x, right? The wave function. But then there, you, you are only able to plot the position value, right? The wave function corresponding to the position variable. If you want to plot the wave function correspond, corresponding to a momentum variable, then you have to construct a different, different space now, where your x-axis will be p. So essentially, you need two different spaces. But since in phase space, we have x and p together, why not come up with a um, distribution function, which can simultaneously, you know, 
uh, give us the probability for or give the distribution for both x and b. So that thing is uh, nicely done by the Wigner function. Again, uh, there are different variants of Wigner function. I mean, not exactly variants of them, but uh, which are also distribution functions related to Wigner function. But we are not going to that today. Uh, today we are just looking at Wigner functions as a function of x and b, which can give you the probability distribution in the x p phase space where you can plot a that's like quantum state. And the map of that Wigner function looks something like this. Um, but uh, again, we do not need to uh, know the, the formalism of the function for this tutorial. So I'm kind of bypassing it for now. But this is how, you know, uh, a Wigner function uh, mathematically looks. The same can be an integration. And then uh, inside the integration, you have a inner product of a quantum state rho. Uh, and to the left of it, you have this x plus y by 2 and x minus y by 2. x is again the solution operator. Sorry, I mean the position value. And uh, y here is just uh, y is not a value corresponding to the term, but it's just a number. Uh, and just to give you a graphical feel uh, how Wigner functions look, this is the Wigner function of a vacuum state. Okay, so you, you see it already looks like a Gaussian, right? And that is again centered around, uh, here it is P and Q. Uh, so they are essentially denoting P and X. So the mean value is again zero, just like we saw here. But then there is this noise, right? This, you, you can see a spread in the uh, spread around the mean of q and a spread around the mean of p and that's why you know th this is how the representation so if i if i don't take this 3d figure and I, if i just take the 2d figure then this is essentially this plot when you have a circle in the x p space and in 3d space you can nicely see the probability distribution right that in x how much it is and p how much it is so you can essentially project this 3D space to position side or inventor side. Um, so that's the idea of uh, Wigner function. So what are the key things that uh, we can take away from this first slide? First thing is that we can go from a classical phase space to a quantum phase space where the states are represented by blocks and not by dots. And in this space, space then we associate something called a Wigner function, which can tell us about the position and momentum, probably position and momentum probably distribution. Okay. All right. Next, let's. Yeah. So now is the right time to get into the formalism of CD quantum optics. CD stands for continuous variable. And then you know quantum optics is a uh, uh, wide field of research these days. So continuous variable quantum optics. So like many other things in physics, even this topic starts with a harmonic oscillator. Okay. Yeah. So it's really quantum optics. A good point to start is start from harmonic oscillator. And if you have studied it before, then you might know that for any given mode k. We can associate a annihilation operator and a pressure operator, right? AK and AK backer. So K is just a mode index. Um, and what is a mode? Yeah, the, the meaning of mode would be very confusing. But uh, to simplify the story, I would say mode is the solution to Maxwell electromagnetic wave equation. Okay, so any solution to that equation is, okay. is a, a mode essentially. Uh, and it would be having a specific polarization, a special direction, and uh, uh, specific frequency. Okay. So, all right. You can also just ignore this K for the moment and just think about this E and A divided with the uh, annihilation and annihilation operators. Uh, they're also called as um, mode operators. Okay. Essentially, mode. To uh, yeah, to satisfy a relation. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, can the organize? Sorry.
Okay, uh, I, I just assumed that there was some disturbance. It, it was not a question. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, go ahead. If you have some questions, then we'll be pausing five minutes from now. So I'll take some questions here. Uh, please switch uh, your screen to the full mode. Okay, but uh, yeah, the point is if I do that, then okay. I may lose. So let me try. Control L. For some reason, it is not possible here. Even after doing it to 120, 160, 180 possibilities. It's fine, you can continue. Okay, I hope it's, it's not uh, too small. It's I'm sorry about too system at least. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so, yeah, we're talking about mode operators. So, we can associate this. E and E dagger to a certain mode. And important thing is, they don't commute. Okay, so if excuse I just me, say, mm -hmm. uh, hi Professor Barik, can you please explain me how you define this any general quadrature? I I can see the math here, like we are using the commutation relations that I can really understand. But like any general quadrature of this type, like it it will be just a wave function, simple wave function, isn't so? Uh, uh, thank you for your question, Dipansu. I really appreciate it, but then uh, I'm yet to come there. So if you could uh, uh, wait for that, I would appreciate that. I I'm yet to come to the point of quadrature object. Okay, okay, fine. No issues. I actually, I was curious to look at the general expression because the entire slide has a lot of information in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I really know. I mean, I, I actually wanted to animate it, but it's a lot of equations, so I struggled. So that's why I have to put the overwhelming amount of information in front of me. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, thank so, you so yeah. So once you define this uh, A and um, A diagram mode operators, then we talk about uh, their commutation relations. So you can see two different modes. Okay, if you have two different modes K and L, then their mode operators commute. So A K and A L commute, and A K dagger and A L dagger commute. Okay, so if you have different modes, then they're uh, mode operators come for sure. If you have same mode, okay, then a a dagger equals to one. Okay, a a dagger, so a comma a dagger equals to one, and that thing is essentially captured by this chronicle delta relation. So delta k l value is one if k and l are same, right? So you get a k a k dagger equals to one or a l a l dagger. One, whereas if k and l are different, which is zero. So that captures it. Now we use these mode operators to construct something called quadrature operators x and p. So what we do, we essentially take their uh, uh, combination. So if you take the plus combination, so a k plus a k dagger divided by root two, then you uh, get your x k. And if you do a k minus a k dagger and divided by i root two, then you get your p k. All right, uh, and they are called quadrature operators because um, x and p they they form a quadrant, right? You can say they are they are ninety degree apart from each other. So I think this is this quadrature thing comes from classical electronics, if I'm not wrong. So yeah, they are, they are ninety degree apart, so they they are just called quadrature operators. I think. Um, but essentially, x k and p k could be constructed from a k and a k dagger, but there's something uh, interesting here. In different books, you would see different definitions. So you may also find xk equals to a plus a dagger and pk equals to a k minus a k dagger uh, without the root 2m. So this would depend upon your choice of h bar. So if you choose h bar equals to one, then this definition follows. If you choose h bar equals to two, then you will have to omit this root two. Okay, you could do this calculation uh, I mean, this is a very straightforward calculation from harmonic oscillator of physics, quantum harmonic oscillator of physics. And then you can, so now we wrote the expression for X and P quadrature. But how about a general quadrature? Of I mean, there could be uh, someone who is interested in looking at the diagonal direction, right? 
not just accidentally. You can see that this diagonal direction is again, uh, 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 you can you know decompose it to this X and P, but there they still exists an expression for this, this diagonal, you know, this random quadrature of it. Uh, sorry, uh, random, I should not say quadrature, let's say general, general quadrature. Um, okay, so that you can define using this formula. QK of theta, where theta is the angle in which you are looking at. So let's say X is the, uh, you, you are, X is here, and then you are taking the uh, quadrature direction here or here or here. So, so the angle from X in anti-clockwise direction will be theta. And you can write it in this format, one over root two, a k e power i theta plus two k dagger e power i theta, a k e power minus i theta, sorry, and a k dagger e power i theta. And you can see that if you put theta equals to zero, you again get x k. So if you put theta equals to pi, you get p. So this is how you can you can write a general quadrature operator instead of this uh, x and equal to. I hope this is clear now, Dipansh. Yeah, yes, it's clear now. Thank you so much. Yeah, no worries. And uh, we 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 define the x p commutation relation uh, like this, right? X and p. If it is the same mode, then uh, it is i h cross. If you set h cross, it is just i. If it's different mode, they commute this way, right? Different operators of different modes, they always commute. If you are talking about the general quadrature, then you can again define a, a commutation relation for them. And that commutation relation then would look something like this, the thing in the red. And this is, uh, I would like to leave you, you know, as an exercise, you can, you can check that this works. All right, so this is about, you know, the mode operators and the quadrature operators. So the mode operators are A and A dagger and the quadrature operators are X and X dagger, sorry, X and P. And uh, we can go from A, A dagger to X and P. We can also go from X and P to A and A dagger. So this is the sort of gist of this slide. And then we use this to do further things. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so I, I believe everybody's kind of getting what I'm telling them. All right, so let me go to the next page. So next page, okay. Um, yeah, all right. A convenient way to describe a bosonic system is through a vector of quadrature operators. Okay. So now we saw just in the previous slide, we saw X and P operators and then A and A dagger operators. So let's come back to X and P operators again. Okay. So suppose you have many modes, okay? Let's say you have a N mode quantum system. So for each mode, you have a X and P, right? So X1, P1, X2, P2, likewise X and PN. Now all these modes, you can contain within one vector. Okay, and that vector we often call as quadrature vector. Some people call it displacement vector as well, but uh, I'm, I'm saving that name for something else. We'll, you will see later. So I will call this a quadrature vector, which essentially contains the X and P quadratures of uh, all the modes of a N mode system. Okay, so R will essentially be a vector of 2N cross 1 order, right? Yeah, because for each mode, you have two quadrature. Okay, so R will be a two and cross one vector, and it would have uh, this X and P operators for each mode. Uh, this hat thing here, I think it's uh, more relevant if I put the arrow rather than a hat, because even though X and P's are uh, operators, I'm storing them now in a vector form. So uh, uh, forgive me for this uh, typo. Okay. All right, so now how about a commutation relation between these? We know that there exists a commutation relation between X and P1, there exists a commutation relation between X1, X2, P1, X2, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there is exists a commutation relation between all the operators. So a nice way of putting them in a compact way is this. 
RK RL is I times this omega KL. So when I learned this for the first time, I struggled. I mean, even later, I struggled to understand this business. I mean, how this compact relation describes uh, the commutation relation of all axis and P's inside this R vector. So let's take a moment to uh, look at that. So what is RK and RL here? RK and RL, they essentially represent one particular uh, element of the R vector. Okay, so RK and RL, they are not two different quadrature vectors, remember. They are two different elements of a single quadrature vector. Okay, so um, let's take, for example, uh, um, a two mode system. Okay, so a two mode system will have, sorry, will have X1, P1, X2, P2. All right, so this is my R now, it's a two mode system. So R is X1, P1, R2, P2. And then X1, I denote as R1, P1 would be R2, X2 would be R3, and P2 would be R4. Now, if I if I go with this definition, okay, that uh, this omega TL is nothing but an entry of here and LH index of this matrix. Okay, so N here is 2. So this identity would be a two cross two matrix, which will be multiplied with this. And if you multiply identity with this, then we get a two mode sigma, sorry, two mode omega matrix, which is this 0, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 0. Okay. All right. Now let's see how the commutation relation behaves. So R1, R2. Okay. R1, R2 uh, is essentially R1 for X1 and R2 for P1. So X1, P1. And we know that uh, for the same, uh, for, for a single mode, X and P's commutation is I, right? H cross we have taken as one, so it is I. So I, I write that as I into one, and then it is nothing but sigma one to element. I mean, sigma one to element, you can see, denoted as one here, right? Sigma one to element. Sigma one to is one. Similarly, R1, R3 corresponds to X1, X2. And since they are, uh, from two different modes, it is essentially zero, they commute. And uh, then um, uh, it is zero. So that corresponds to your omega one three as per this KL definition, right? And you can see the omega one three here is zero. Sorry, one three is zero. zero. And likewise, you see it for P one X, sorry. Uh, you can see it for, I can't see the last one, but uh, I guess it is, uh, R2 and then R1. Okay, yeah, R2 and R1. So that corresponds to P1 X1 commutator, which we know has to be minus i, right? Xp is i, so Px is minus i, and that is given by the omega P1 matrix element. Okay, and so on. So this compact relation nicely describes the canonical commutation relations for all the operators contained for all the X and P operators contained inside a quadrature vector. All right. Okay, so I hope, I mean, in this slide, there's nothing much uh, than just the definition of quadrature vector. So we have a R vector, which essentially contains uh, uh, the X and P quadratures of a, uh, let's say, uh, N mode system. And then we can describe their commutation relationship nicely. Okay, then let's go to the next slide. Uh, yes. So in the next slide, we are discussing about, okay. So anybody have a question? Um, yeah, so suddenly when some noise comes, it seems to me like somebody standing for somebody's uh, up for a question. Anyway, okay, let's, let's go to the uh, next aspect. So let's look at covariance map. It has to come because we are essentially um, in a talk of Gaussian states and Gaussian matrices, right? And if you are talking about a Gaussian, then you have to talk about its covariance and its uh, mean, right? The uh, statistical movements of it. Okay, so what is the covariance matrix? Um, if you have a n mode quantum system, then its covariance matrix is denoted by this uh, sigma. 
defined by this. So sigma k l here, k and l here again they denote k and l they denote the uh, entry that particular entry of the R vector. Okay, so it will be is it is defined as half of the expectation value of the anti commutator of R k and R l. So anti commutator of delta R k and delta R l. And what is this delta R k again? Delta R k is nothing but R k minus R k mean. So R k mean here is same as uh, the expectation value of R. Okay. So sometimes one confusion arises here that um, the quadrature vector we are defining. The quadrature vector is uh, contains the entry of operators, but I can also define a vector which contains x1, p1, x2, p2, x3, p3, and so on, where this x's and p's are the values and not operators. Okay, so this two one has to keep in mind. But uh, here we 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 are talking about uh, the the variables so the values of the the values matrix and not the operator so in this definition again you can ignore this at they, they should not be at. Um, okay but uh, keeping that confusion aside a delta r k so basically a noise of a variable is any value of the variable minus the mean value of so essentially what you do in an experiment, you try to measure something and you measure it, let's say 100 times. So 100 times you get different values of it. Then you have a mean value of it, okay? You take the average of it and then you have a mean and then you have all these 100 values. So for each 100 values, you can calculate this R minus R mean, right? And that essentially is your delta R. Okay, okay. so this is how the covariance matrix of a quantum system is defined. It is half of expectation value of anti commutators. So I hope you understand what is an anti commutator. An anti commutator of A and B operator would be AB plus BA. If it's just like a commutator is AB minus BA, an anti commutator is AB plus BA. Okay. So this curly bracket denotes an anti. Uh, anti commutator. I'm really sorry, I, I have not uh, mentioned it. I forgot. Uh, but yeah, I hope you got it now. <clears throat> but then this looks different from the classical definition of a covariance matrix. In general, a covariance matrix is a square matrix that gives the covariance between each pair of variables. For example, if you have a two variable system, so now we are talking about this in classical system. Okay? Let's say you have a two variable system. One variable is your z1 and the other variable is z2. Then you uh, you would define the covariance matrix as a uh, two plus two matrix. The first entry will be covariance of z1 and z1. The second entry would be covariance of z1 and z2. The third being covariance of z2 and z1. And fourth one would be covariance of z2 and z2. Where covariance of Z1 and Z2 is defined like this. This is the expectation value of delta Z1, delta Z2. Okay, so this is the um, basic definition of a, a covariance between two variables. And you know again what is delta Z1. Delta Z1 is Z1 minus Z1's mean. Okay, Z1 minus Z1's mean. And Z2 is Z2 minus Z2. So, um, if I if I write it further, then the covariance of Z1 and Z2, again, we are just talking about the usual classical covariance now, okay, for a, for a classical system. Um, covariance of uh, Z1 and Z2. So if we follow by this, um, you can ignore this hat again. I'm really sorry, uh, I've done some mistake with this hat here. So here you can ignore this hat. So covariance of Z1 and Z2. Um, okay, so all right. So there's something of a catch here. See, if, if Z1 and Z2 are just two variables, okay, classical variables, then their covariance is defined as delta Z1, delta Z2, all right? 
that's it but if it is a quantum operator so if these are operators then for those you know their ordering sort of matters and that's why it's better to consider both the order okay so delta z1 delta z2 and delta z2 delta z1 and then divide it by two you divide it by two because you you, you sort of uh, want to take the average of those two and there is a reason we use a commutator in the definition rather than just you know delta rk rl here so the whole idea is we take care of you know this ordering this operator ordering effect when we define the covariance matrix for a quantum system because the values are again the values from operators so covariance matrix of a, a quantum shapes that's that's why have this anti commutator inside okay uh, and if i follow that then you know the sigma for a two mode system would essentially look something like this half into delta r k delta r k um commutator's expectation value then the second term is uh with delta r k delta r l the third one being the delta r l delta r k and the fourth one is delta r l delta r l okay now the first one delta r k delta r k this commutator i mean what what would it be so it would be again delta r k delta r k plus delta r k delta r k right ab commutator is a comma b is commutator is ab plus ba here a and b are same so essentially it is going to be delta r k the square right um delta r k delta r k yeah essentially it will be two times delta r k square okay and that is why if you divide it by half that two would be cancelled and here you would just leave with this so again there's a mistake ah terrible so this half should not be here this half should only go with the octagonal terms and they should not uh, be in front of the diagonal terms because in the diagonal terms what you have after the first step after the first step in the diagonal step what you have is you have two times delta r squared so this half from you know the left of the bracket multiplies and then you just get delta r r squared and now you know that this delta r squared is nothing but the variance well okay the delta r squared is nothing but the variance value just like delta r k denotes the noise delta r k denotes the variance so the diagonal elements of a covariance matrix therefore denotes the variances whereas the off diagonal elements they denotes the correlations why do i say correlation because now you see a relief now you see a term that involves both l mode and k mode here so it sort of relates you know the two modes l and k and they those terms are in the off diagonal elements so essentially the entire take from this slide is that for a quantum system for a n mode quantum system you can have a covariance matrix okay where the diagonal terms would give you the variances and the off diagonal terms would give you the correlations later we'll see some states in which there will be correlations and correlations mean here quantum correlations which may mean entanglement that means if you are seeing essentially an entangled state then its covariance matrix must contain you know off diagonal terms so that's that that's the idea here all right uh that's it about covariance matrix and now i'm going to go to the next slide uh if you have any questions then i can take i'll just pause for a few seconds all right i think uh, you guys are with me so let me move to the next slide and in next slide we'll talk directly about gaussian states okay so so far we saw what is a covariance matrix right does someone have a question because i can hear some noise excuse me sir yeah what kind of correlation like the variance and the correlation is between the two states which we are specifying here by this uh, matrix like what kind of it is is it some sort of um, like can we define it in some sort of entanglement 
because when we talk about optics quantum optics we try to look at the photonic st uh, photon statistics of the uh, wave right so like if i go experimentally and i want to look at this matrix what kind of correlation it suggests yeah so for example uh we talk about something called a two mode free state okay okay so let's just uh, talk about a two mode state okay so you have a state i mean which has two modes okay so now you have two mode state and this guy has x1 p1 and this guy has x1 p1 right sorry this guy has x2 p2 this is mode one this is mode two x1 p1 and x2 p2 so suppose my x1 equals to x2 or p1 equals to minus so if x1 equals to x2 then i say there is a direct correlation between the position of the first mode and the position of the second mode and p1 equals to minus p2 would correspond to there is a direct anti correlation between momentum of first mode and the momentum of the second mode okay so you see this kind of okay sir thank you yeah i hope that made some sense all right so we looked at the covariance matrix okay of a quadrature vector we can also talk about then uh, the uh, displacement vector or the mean of a, sorry let me go back to the past slide because i think i missed something so okay in this slide this r was a quadrature vector right which essentially describes our quantum state and then we saw that for this quantum state of any mode we can define a we can define a covariance matrix but then we can also define a displacement vector or a mean vector okay and that mean vector would be nothing but just a vector having the mean of this operator so 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 i mean it would be x1 x1 mean p1 mean x2 mean p2 mean x1 so for every quadrature vector every quantum state we can now define a displacement vector or a mean vector and a covariance vector because these two will be needed for gaussian space okay so a gaussian distribution is one which can be completely defined by its first two moments mean and variance all right uh, and it is defined as following so suppose you have a distribution of variable y okay and then this gaussian distribution will be defined by its first moment which is the mean of y and the and the second moment which is the variance but variance is v square here here v square is the variance uh, v would be the standard deviation but i have still kept it uh, v and not s again i beg your pardon for that but yeah i hope it, it still gives you the meaning so it it's essentially a distribution over variable y and for uh, completely defining this distribution all you need is the mean and the uh, the variance value okay or the standard deviation value and this gaussian function is defined like this this is one of the most standard function in mathematics i would say and especially used in statistics uh, statistics so this is how you define the gaussian distribution so mean and variance these two moments are sufficient to define a gaussian distribution the same applies to a gaussian quantum state okay if or i can say if a quantum state can be completely defined by its mean and its covariance matrix then you call it as a gaussian quantum state so so to know everything about this this quantum state all you need to know is essentially the mean and the variance of it or also to do any operation on this gaussian quantum state you know and and to see how how things would behave all you would need to know is its mean and its variance so basically tracking the gaussian quantum state then tracking the quantum state then would be tracking how its mean and variance would be changed mean and covariance matrix okay so that is one thing so a gaussian quantum state is completely defined by the first and second statistical moments that is the displacement vector r and the covariance matrix sigma the second point being for a gaussian state its linear function is also gaussian 
okay, for a Gaussian space is really the function of the Gaussian. And now let, let's pay some attention here. So W of R, right? R is the quadrature vector. And now I'm defining the Wigner function for it. And uh, to, to, to keep this Wigner function Gaussian, we need to have its mean and its variance, right? Mean and its, sorry, here it is covariance matrix. So you can see here, it is again an exponential over minus half. So this minus half and this two, one by two here are, 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 are analogous. And then you, this entire thing, two to the power, uh, two pi to the power n into under root determinant of sigma, this entire thing is, is just like a one by root two pi factor here. So this entire thing is just in constant multiplied here. And this is, so essentially you can compare these two exponential, this one and this one. So here it was y minus y mean square, right? So here it is r minus r dagger transpose and then r minus r dagger here. The sigma inverse, which is a variance inverse, you can you can basically as, uh, imagine like take the sigma to the denominator, okay? If you take the sigma to the denominator, it would be like r minus r bar t into r minus r bar divided by sigma. So, so I'm just trying to give you a, you know, analogy between these two, but these are operators and that's why you cannot uh, draw a direct, you know, uh, direct analogy, but they look the same. At least. So this is how, you know, you, you could uh, have a image of the image of how a Wigner function of a quantum state is Gaussian, okay? For example, if you take the vacuum state, for a vacuum state, the displacement vector is again zero and zero, right? So what is this zero? This zero corresponds to the mean value of X and the second zero corresponds to the mean value of P. And, and that is how it is for vacuum state. And the variance, if you calculate for X and P of a vacuum state, they come out to be half, okay? And they are denoted by the diagonal elements of this covariance factor. Okay. Um, all right. So for a vacuum state, you you define it using its mean value and variance and covariance matrix. Okay. All right. Now, uh, so this is all we need to know about a Gaussian space. So for a Gaussian space. It's Wigner function is going to be Gaussian. Okay. Uh, just a second. Yeah, my laptop was not plugged in. So I think I was plugged in. All right. Um, I just need to double share. Plugged in. Yeah, cool. So for a Gaussian space, there are a few things I need to know, right? One. It should be completely um, defined by its mean and covariance. So we need to know its mean and covariance. And then its Wigner function should look, Wigner function should be a Gaussian function uh, of its mean and covariance. And for vacuum state, we will see one example. Now we can transition to Gaussian calculations. So we have all these Gaussian states. Now we can look at Gaussian operations. And what are Gaussian operations? Gaussian operations are those operations which basically act on Gaussian state to transfer them into another Gaussian state. So if you have a Gaussian state and, it is, and then, then there is an operation that is applied on it, so just taking it again to a Gaussian state, another Gaussian state, then it's essentially a Gaussian operation. Okay. Uh, and how do so from where do these Gaussian operations come? They come from Hamiltonians, right? So operations in quantum world are unitary often, okay? So we talk about unitary operations. So here we'll talk about Gaussian unitaries and unitaries are generated from Hamiltonians. Now, this is a pretty, uh, this could be a detailed theory if you would like to pause you, but I would just put it here. If you have a Gaussian unitary, then it must be, coming from a Hamiltonian, which is at max second order in X or T. So this Hamiltonian H will be at maximum, you know, X square. Of course, it could also be 
a function of x and t, but at max it could be a function of x squared and t squared. Again, I forgot a hat here, but goli maro. Okay. So if you have a Hamiltonian of t on d squared, second order of x and t, then the unitary that you would generate using that would be a Gaussian unitary. Okay. And uh, in general, in labs, it is easy to produce Hamiltonians up to second order in X and T. That is the reason it is easy to generate Gaussian unitary operation. And once we know this Gaussian, Gaussian unitary, then we, we, we try to see how they transform Gaussian states. Right? We have a Gaussian operation, and then we would like to see how they transform Gaussian states. So we can, we can see the transformation in two ways. One, how do they transform the the mode operator A. So this is a formalism, right? You know how our operator is transformed. So there will be a u dagger to the left of it and there would be a u to the right of it. Okay, so A here will be transformed by this u g dagger d g. So this is how Hello. you write it. Uh, yes. Sorry for interruption. Uh, uh, where could you make it in full screen, please? So uh, it will be uh, good to... Uh, uh, it will yeah, be now, mm -hmm. yeah, now it sort of worked, but I'm still not able to. There is always some of that problem with Zoom. Trying to zoom, but then I cannot scroll. You can go to the view. In menu, you have view, and then you will see cone. Yes, you can you can even use control layers as well. Yes, full screen. Third from, from the bottom. bottom. Yeah. Ah, okay. Why, yes, yes. Why, didn't, it's not why didn't I know it before? It's one hour already. Okay. Sorry about it. So, um, transformation. Yeah, we are we are talking about transformation. So when we look at that transformation, we basically see the transformation of this mode operator A. Okay. So A will be transformed as U G dagger E U G. How this transformation occurs, we'll see as very definite examples in the coming slide, but this is how you can see. So A will be transformed by a dagger and just without dagger on the right. Then there could be, you can look at this Gaussian transform, uh, transformation in another way. So you can look at the R vector of the Gaussian state. So essentially you can, you can look at the quadrature vector of the Gaussian state, and then you see how this quadrature, quadrature um, vector transform and how the okay, I forgot to write something else here. Okay, but uh, essentially the Gaussian transformation will trans uh, will transform the quadrature vectors R as a symplectic matrix S operating on R plus a uh, a translation operator D. So D here, I won't call it displacement because I've given that name to something else already, right? Uh, uh, so D here is translation, okay? So essentially, your quadrature vector will be transformed by the operation of a, uh, by the operation of a symplectic matrix, and then there will be another vector added to it. Well, things will become more clear as we do examples, but, but this is just to put it in a mathematical form. And this S operation is something specific, sorry, it's something special in the sense that this S operation must satisfy this condition. So the, again, there's, there's a lot of uh, group theory uh, with theoretical aspects to it. So this S comes from a symplectic group. Uh, yeah, so symplectic group, et cetera, which I'm, I'm not uh, uh, very well aware of, but all I know is this S transforms this uh, omega matrix, you remember, right? Omega matrix essentially captures the commutation relations between all the x's and t's variables. Uh, and it, it essentially goes like s omega s t, so t is transpose, and it stays just as omega. So the omega doesn't change under the operation of this s matrix. Okay? So this is the speciality about this s matrix. Uh, but but for, for our need, all we need to know is this S matrix is something that takes the R to SR and then add a translation vector. Okay. And of course, this S has to be a square matrix. 
compatible with the order of the r vector all right so these are two ways of seeing how a unitary a gaussian unitary would be acting on a uh, uh, on a gaussian space uh, but yes yeah, something that i did not include in here here in the bottom is the following so here i i told you how the quadrature vector would be changing right by this s matrix right this s matrix is again a part of this gaussian transformation so if you have a gaussian transformation or a gaussian operator then that gaussian operator contains two things it contains a s matrix which is a square matrix and then it contains a translation operator g so now this gaussian operator since it is acting on a gaussian state it can essentially change two things of this gaussian state and these two things are the uh, displacement vector of this gaussian state and the uh, covariance matrix of this gaussian state so how it would change the displacement operator of the gaussian state that you can get an idea from here so in place of r vector if you just put your displacement vector that is just r bar right as we noted it before as we denoted it before r bar so it would be r bar going r bar change to s on r bar plus this translation operator d added to it okay and now the interesting part is how sigma will change sigma the covariance matrix the covariance matrix will change just like s sigma and s transpose so just like here because here also this omega is also a matrix right so s would essentially transform transfer this uh, transform this matrix as transform the covariance matrix as s sigma s transpose so in in the next coming in the upcoming slides or uh, pdf pages what we would see we would look at different gaussian operations and then we would see how they transform the mode operator a and uh and in another way how they transform the two gaussian moments the uh, mean vector and the covariance matrix of a gaussian space okay so i think uh, we can take a uh, three to five minutes break now if uh, it is fine uh tamal are you there or yes yes i am here Yeah, so is it fine to take a two uh, three minute break? Yeah, okay, okay, it's still fine. Take okay, so so it is uh, uh, almost uh, four now. Let's meet at uh, four five. Um, I was four four. Okay. Okay. Again, good. participant is uh, don't leave this uh, session uh, it will start soon within 4 to 5 minutes okay okay Okay. Okay. So transform the covariance matrix as S sigma S transpose. So in this point.
Jamal, uh, are you there? Or yes, yes, I am here. Yeah. So, is it fine to take a fifteen uh, minute break? Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's still fine. Okay. Yeah. So, so it is uh, uh, almost uh, four now. Let's meet at uh, four five. Um, I was four four. Okay. Participant, please uh, don't leave this uh, session. Uh, uh, it will start soon within four to five minutes. Okay. Participant, please uh, don't leave this uh, session. Uh, it will start soon within four to five minutes. Okay. Person, please uh, don't leave this uh, session. Uh, it will start soon within four to five minutes. Person within four to five minutes. Okay, uh, by Adipal again. Yes, yes I, I can. can. Perfect. Uh, can, can you see the top line by the way? Because for me, it is uh, kind of yes. hidden by the displacement. displacement. Yeah, you can see the displacement, right? Okay, and also the the top right, top right most line, e to the power a, b, e to the power minus yes. a. Okay, yes. cool. All right, so as I mentioned, Next, we will be looking at different Gaussian operations. We have seen so far how Gaussian states would be described. At the very end, we'll see a list of Gaussian states. Okay, but they would make more sense once we know the different Gaussian operations. So now we'll be looking at different Gaussian operations or Gaussian geometries. Uh, again, the slides is, the slide is overwhelming, but uh, please try to be with my uh, pointer so that we go step by step. Okay, so the essential thing that we learn now is that a Gaussian operator would transform the displacement factor and the 
um, sigma for the covariance matrix of a uh, Gaussian state, and it would also transform A, the mode operator or the <clears throat> angulation operator. Okay, so the displacement operator is defined using this. Why it is defined like this? That's a different story. I encourage you to 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 dig it out. But yeah, so for this talk, I'll just uh, say that displacement operator is defined like this. It is an exponential alpha a diagram minus alpha star a, and then I make a claim that it transforms a as the following: a plus alpha. Okay. So again, here I am omitting the uh, hat sign, but I think you can understand that. So d dagger e d equals to a plus alpha. But now that I, I told you that, how do you prove it? So I'll I'll go for over this proof, and then you can do the same for all the other Gaussian operations. Okay. So all you need to know is the structure of this unitary. What is this unitary? It's exponential of what? If it is an exponential, and then using this formalism that we will see in this proof, you can see. How it would transform E. So let's let's go step by step. So D D dagger alpha is this exponential alpha star E minus alpha E dagger. So again, what is alpha? Alpha is a complex number. Okay, alpha is a complex number which essentially tells you by what amount it displaces the T. So in the starting, I mentioned right, there's this vacuum state in the center of this T space, and then there's coherent state somewhere else. So but but the noise they have the same. Right, the delta x will definitely have seen. So, so in in order to go from this vacuum state to coherent state, what is happening is it's getting displaced. So, this amount of displacement is denoted by this value alpha, and this alpha is a complex number. It has a magnitude and it has a uh, direction. <laughs> okay, so if it's a complex number, then it might it it will be having alpha star as well. Cool. So, this if d of alpha is this, then d dagger of alpha you can write as exponential alpha star a minus alpha e dagger. Which is again, if I take a negative common, then I can write again as you know minus of alpha e dagger minus alpha star a. Okay, so writing it fully, so d dagger alpha a d alpha would look like exponential of minus alpha e dagger minus alpha star a, then a sandwich, and then to the right exponential alpha e dagger minus alpha star a, and this I can write as exponential to the power capital a times b. Times exponential to the power uh, minus of capital A, and remember these are not just numbers, so that you can you know move this B to the right and then you cancel E to the power X to the power minus X equals to you know one, X minus X equals to zero, and by zero. And that doesn't happen here because A and B are commutators. Sorry, operators here. Okay, so the orders are very important. So. This entire operation would look like E to the power A B E to the power minus A here. I substitute, you know, for this minus minus of alpha a dagger minus alpha star a as capital A, and capital B uh, represents small a. Okay, and then I'm I'm doing this to exploit something called Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff relation. So this BC relation is something um, very used in quantum optics, and I think also in other fields. And this goes like following. So if you have this form, e to the power a b e to the power minus a. Then this essentially um, becomes b plus uh, one over one factorial commutator of a b plus one over two factorial commutator of a b with a, and then further commutators. Okay, so essentially, first you you need to calculate all these commutators. So so first calculate commutator of a b and then commutator the other commutator. Then compute the other commutator, and then you write this as an entire series. So let's do that. So we know what is our e and what is our b. So remember, our e is this expression minus of my. See the negative sign here is very important. Otherwise, you get different different results. So a is minus of alpha e dagger minus alpha star a, and b is a, right? So a b here will be this commutator of this thing with a. So again, I can divide this commutator like this. Alpha is a number, complex number, but still a number. So number I can take out of a commutator. So I keep it here, uh, alpha outside, and then a dagger commutator a. Similarly, this minus and this minus becomes plus here. So you have alpha star and then a a. So a and a would commute, right? They are the same operators, of course. So this commutator is zero, 
and this commutator is minus one because a a dagger a a dagger commutator is one, so a dagger a commutator is minus one, and essentially you get a b commutator as alpha. And now, if your a b commutator is alpha, then the commutator of a b with a will be zero, because if you take an operator, then an operator always commutes with a number. So an operator comma a number, a commutator is a zero. Okay, so that's why if a b is alpha, then a a b would be zero, and a comma a a b would be also zero. So all the higher order commutators will be zero. Essentially, your um, e a e to the power minus a would now just limit to the first two terms only b and a b. And we know that B is A, and then A B commutator is alpha. So hence we prove that D dagger alpha A D alpha is A plus alpha. So this is how the displacement operator is transforming the annihilation operator A, and how would it transform then the operator A dagger alpha? It, it that also you can calculate using the same approach, and it would be A dagger alpha star. And once you have this two. Then you can take a linear combination of this. Thing. So now I, I I try to see how d dagger alpha, sorry how how d of alpha transform this whole operator e plus e dagger by root two. Okay, so so just just by adding this two, I can write it here divide divide by root two, and I can further factorize it. Okay, like this. So I I take e and e dagger club them together. I e e dagger plus root two, and then I club. As fine alpha star and and write it as root two. So here I take a and a dagger as x. Okay, and then you have a. I mean I, I do some further adjustment just to make alpha plus alpha star uh, by two here inside this bracket because this then correspond to the real part of alpha, right? Z is a complex number. Then z plus z star by root two is the real part of z. So I have just written that, and then this this thing becomes this. So essentially. Just by knowing this thing, how your displacement operator transforms mode operator A, you can know how it's going to transform X and how you can it 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 will transform B. So now we know how our displacement operator would be transforming X and T. So X would be changing to X plus square root two real part of alpha, and T would be changing to square root two imaginary part of part of alpha. Okay, and What is this xp? This xp is nothing but your uh, displacement factor, right? Uh, yes, or yeah. So I can now from this relation know how my r dagger would transform. Sorry, not r dagger, but uh, uh, the uh, mean vector. Sorry, this is the displacement vector. Sorry, this this xp here is just the coordinate vector. Uh, so how the displacement vector would change? Just replace x with x bar, p here with p bar, and then add this, you know, these two things. So essentially, I can write it as something like this. So s is doing nothing to r bar. Okay, so s is doing nothing to r bar, but this d is adding these two things: root two real part of alpha and root two imaginary part of alpha. And that's why I took up the symplectic transformation now as S is just the identity operator doing nothing, and this D, the translation vector, is now square root two real part of alpha, square root two imaginary part of alpha. Okay. Uh, and then you can also see once we have this S symplectic transformation, how it would transform the sigma matrix, the covariance matrix. It would transform like this, and since it is identity, S is identity, so S S of the transpose of S is also identity. So essentially, nothing happens to the sigma. So sigma comes as it is to the outside. Okay, so this is how your R vector, displacement vector, and the covariance matrix of a uh, Gaussian space would change under the operation of displacement operator. So. Just to just to summarize this slide again, we are talking about displacement operator. All it does is place a constant. We first look at its action on A, 
And then from A, we know its action on A dagger as well. And from this two, we know its action on X and P. And from this two, we know its action on the displacement vector R bar. And also, yeah, uh, displacement operator R bar. From that, we, we can cook up this symplectic transformation S. And then simply transformation S and D. And from that, again, you know, we, we know the covariance, uh, how the covariance matrix transform. So essentially, if you know the structure of the displacement operator, the mathematical structure of the any Gaussian operator, then we can, you know, know how it's um, uh, how it's going to change the Gaussian state by changing its uh, mean and variance or the uh, displacement vector and the uh, previous matrix. All right, so any question on this thing? Not really, so I would just move on. So the next operation then is phase shift. So this is another pretty widely used operation in quantum optics laboratory. And we define the unitary of it as this. So R of theta is defined as exponential to the power minus i theta n cap. N cap here is the number operator, number operator, which is again a dagger a. I have not written it here, but I assume that you know the number operator n is a dagger a. So this rotation operator r of theta is essentially rotating a quantum state. And we'll see how it rotates again to the max. But the claim is that it rotates the mode a by this amount theta just like this. So A transforms to e to the power minus i theta A. And uh, we have already seen in the previous slide how this is done through the Gaussian transformation, right? You do all this uh, bigger transfer thing and you can calculate this. Once you know this, you can then know how it would change X and P. And if you do the match correctly, then you would see that X changes to X cos theta plus P sine theta and P changes to minus X sine theta and P cos theta. And this transformation, then you can write using this symplectic matrix S as cos theta, cos theta, sin theta, minus theta. So this is again like a rotation matrix, right? So R vector would then, yeah, and you would see that the, uh, the translation operator D is now a null vector, zero, zero, because there's no term added here and here. So X just changes, you know, the, the just rotate this to some combination of X and P. And that's why the Gaussian state will now transform from R vector to um, S R vector plus D vector. So X cos theta P sin theta and then minus X sin theta P cos theta. And then Sigma would be changing to Sigma prime. Okay. And uh, how it would be again? By the operation of S and S P, you know the S and then I leave you to do this calculation in the red. So whatever is in the red, Written in red color is, is essentially a task for you. So please go home and uh, try 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 this one. Okay, and uh, see that if you take theta equals to zero, then it should do nothing. So xp should be in xp which you take theta equals to zero, and if you choose theta equals to five, then you would get something else. Okay, so see see if for zero, five by two and five, and, and, and try to try to verify that your match is correct. All right. So this is about the phase shift operation. Now let's go to single mode squeezing. So this is again another beautiful uh, Gaussian operations. So intuitively, what it does is it squeezes the noise. Squeezing here means squeezing the noise. So you have the actual vacuum state. It has noise in x quadrature and the noise in d quadrature. Just like I have the noise at the police van now. So the noise of x quadrature and the noise of p quadrature, but the squeezing operator comes and then it can squeeze the noise in x, okay, at the expense of anti-squeezing the noise in p. So the overall noise has to has to you know uh, satisfy the Heisenberg relation delta x delta p. The product must be greater than h bar by two, but there is no restriction on how how less delta x would be, right? You 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 squeeze delta x and at the cost of you know. Uh, and this squeezing the data. So increase the noise in P, decrease the noise in S, or you could go the other way around as well. So this is what the squeezing operator does. But uh, I'm here mostly focusing on the math part of it. So I'm, I'm showing you the math again. So this is how the squeezing operator looks. So exponential R 
P square, P double square, okay? And then you do the unitary transformation on the mode operator and you will see this thing. But before it, R here is a squeezing parameter. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it before. So R here is a squeezing parameter. So how much you are squeezing, so how much the noise would reduce and how much the noise would, noise would uh, increase in the other, other furniture depend upon this R vector. This could be a complex number as well. Okay, so that would decide again, you are squeezing in this direction or this direction or this direction or this direction. Okay, the squeezing could be in this direction and that is taken by the uh, angle part of this complex number. Okay, and the magnitude part or the real part is just the amount, the degree of squeeze. Okay, by, by, by the strength. Here, just for simplicity, I have chosen R to be your real number. Okay, but it could be complex as well. And you would see a slightly different expression for complex number. There would basically be a E bar IC tablet. But essentially, this is how the A would change. A would become cos H of R hyperbolic function of A minus sine hyperbolic function of A dagger. And then with uh, from, from this, you can uh, calculate A dagger as well with the same Baker Campbell Hausler formula. And then you can find X would change like this, P would change like this. So the symplectic transformation now I can write like this. Okay. So it is having the diagonal elements as k to the power minus r and u to the plus r. And the displacement vector now is zero. Okay, so displacement vector is zero. Sorry, uh, translation vector again is zero. So the symplectic transformation is defined by this two, and the r vector, uh, or yeah, the displacement vector, r is a displacement vector here. This would change as this. So r would essentially be e to the power minus r. Uh, so x bar p bar would change to e to the power minus r x bar e to the power plus r p bar. Okay. And uh, sigma, the covariance matrix would change to sigma prime because it, which is again s sigma s p. And this, if you denote the four L, L, uh, entries as, as sigma 1, 1, sigma 1, 2, sigma 2, and sigma 2, 2, then you would see e to the power minus 2 r and e to the power plus 2 r coming up in the diagonal. So these two entries would be changing. So basically the variances would be changing to e to the power minus 2r and changing by the amount of e to the power minus 2r and e to the power plus 2r. And nothing would be happening to the correlation. So if you talk about squeeze vacuum, that means then we know that in squeeze vacuum, uh, sorry, yeah. In vacuum, we know right how sigma looks the vacuum. The, the uh, diagonal elements are half and half. So for this, the squeeze vacuum, you would see that the diagonal here, you would get a e to the power minus 2r, here you will get a e to the power plus 2r. And then you can write it as s of 2r basically because s of r is this. So s of 2r is e to the power minus 2r and e to the power plus r. Okay? And then this half comes out. So it doesn't really make sense. So in this slide, we looked at how phase shift operation and how squeezing operation would act. So phase shift operation, it changes the angle. Okay, you can go from any 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 direction to any other direction by this operation. And then with squeezing, you can squeeze the noise in one quadrature at the expense of anti-squeezing the noise in the other quadrature. Uh, any question here? All right. Then we go to uh other operations so beam splitters yes beam splitter is perhaps the most important uh operation in the world of quantum optics you can't really imagine a quantum optics experiment without the beam splitter squeezing is done by very few people okay um rotations yeah are done by quite a few people but but something that is done by almost everybody is being being split operation okay so let's let's look at it now so far we have been discussing displacement rotation and squeezing so all these were we were looking these operations these these operations were single mode of so, so they were operating on a single mode of now this being split is a two mode of so what happened being split is essentially like a mirror okay so one mode 
comes, so one light beam comes and then another light beam comes, both of them, you know, go through the beam filter, and then you have two outputs. So you have two inputs, three modes, and then two output modes, and then you will see what are these output modes, okay? So this A and B here now denotes the two different modes. So B of theta, B of theta, is defined as exponential. So this theta is called, again, uh, cos square of theta is called as a transmittivity. So a beam filter, it's essentially something like a mirror, uh, is uh, a, a defining parameter of it is this theta value or the transmittivity, cos square theta transmittivity. So how much transmits and how much reflects? Okay. If it is 50 50 percent, 50 percent transmits and 50 percent reflects, then it is a 50 50 beam filter. This is the most common one. Otherwise, it could be a general, general beam filter in which uh, you can transmit any amounts and you can reflect So this is a general uh, beam filter. Theta is, uh, uh, theta again then this point and then cos theta is So uh, exponential theta a dagger z minus a b dagger, this is a mathematical structure. And root tau is cos theta, sorry, tau is cos theta. So root tau would be cos theta and one minus tau would be sine theta. And yes. Okay, so A would change like this and B would change like this. So now you can see that the beam filter is mixing mode A and mode B. All right, here B again contains mode A and B. And this again you can do in this unitary transformation using uh, DC explanations, etc. You do further, you take further mixes, mixes of these A and B operations, and then you can pick up how your XA, BA, XP, and PB would change. So the interesting aspect of beam filter is you see that X mode is now getting getting converted to a mixture of X A and X P. P is getting converted to P A and P B in the same fashion. So root two, so you see uh, square root now, square root now, uh, square root of one minus tau n. So for the first mode, it's a similar pattern of transformation. For the second mode, again it's a similar transformation, similar pattern of transformation. minus one minus tau and minus one. Tau, tau, right? But essentially, for all the x, I mean, for all the x's and b's, you have a contribution from both modes. So for x, you have a x part and x b part. So p a you have a p a part and p b part. For x b you have a x a part and x b. For p a you have a p a part and p b. But you do not have, you know, for x a or x a and p b. So a position would not be mixing with the moment positions of to different modes of being. That is something to take care of as per this transformation. And then again, using this, you can cook up this symplectic transformation matrix, which would look like this. A compact form would be like this. So tau and then identity, one minus tau and identities, where identity is this, and then this different operation. So the inputter operation, again, you, you need to look at its transformation in two ways. One, you should know how it transforms the annihilation operators A and B of the two modes. And then you should know how its symplectic matrix is going to be, because this symplectic matrix would define the action on, uh, would define the action on um, uh, the displacement operation and the uh, covariance matrix. Yes, Nitesh, you have some question? Please go ahead. You might be muted, I'm not sure, uh, but it shows you have raised your hand. Okay. Uh, Hello, can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm uh, when we use a beam splitter for the uh, uh, for the quantum states that uh, we have two inputs. One has zero, and uh, suppose we give some inputs and uh, and the output we got some uh, state with the phase. Sometimes, so how we add the phase in the beam splitter? Uh, yes, yes, good question, Nitesh. Actually, this definition of beam splitter here, okay. Uh, is not considering that phase part. Okay, this is only considering the transmittivity part. Okay. All right. So there, there could be, yeah, there is another detailed way of uh, defining a beam filter where you include two parameters instead of just one filter. And that would, you know, take care of the, the aspect that you are talking about. Yeah. 
the face part. Some people okay. include here a eye term, but I have not included here a eye term. We have to simplify it. But yeah, you can of course look at that aspect. Of it. Nice for thanks for putting it. Yeah. All right. So these two operations is again a keyboard operation. So two input modes and the two output modes essentially contains components from both the input modes. Okay, from simple number and they, then they have this following simple two constants. The last Gaussian operation that I'm going to talk about is a two modes keyboard operator. And uh, what it does again, now it squeezes two modes simultaneously. We would see how. Okay, so the unitary is like this. Um, so this two here denotes squeezing, uh, I mean, two modes squeezing. And R here is again the squeezing parameter. So two modes, so there has to be two different um, mode operators, A and B, in either and B level here. And uh, so if you do the BC solutions, et cetera, then you, you can arrive at A, transforming to cos HRA minus sin HRB. V transforming to cos HRG and minus sin HRK. And after that, you can again get this transformation as well. XA becoming combination of XA and XB, TA becoming combinations of T and TB, and so on and so forth. If you do one more step by sort of combining them together, then, and, and using the fact that cos HR plus sin HR is e to the power R, and cos HR minus sin HR is e to the power minus R, then you can see this following four sets of relations. You will see that XA minus XB is becoming e to the power minus R XA minus XB. PA plus PB is becoming e to the power minus R PA plus PA. And similarly, XA plus XB is becoming e to the power plus R. PA minus PB is becoming e to the power plus R. So now you can see that two modes are simultaneously getting squeezed here, right? I mean, XA, XB, sorry. So, so XA minus XB is getting squeezed and XA plus XB is getting anti-squeezed. PA plus PB is getting squeezed and PA minus PB is getting squeezed. All right. Um, yes. And using this, again, you can write the symplectic transformation, which would look like this. Remember, this is a two mode operator. So it has to be a four cross four matrix. So identity here is a, a two cross two matrix. Z here is a two cross two matrix. Z is the sigma wave of uh, the usual Z gate from column component sigma wave matrix one zero zero five. And if you do that, it, it would become a four cross two matrix. So S is this, the complete transformation. D is this. From this yellow color set of relation, you can see the transformation on the displacement factor. And from from this S, okay, you can apply it on the on the uh, covariance matrix and see how sigma would change, okay, how the covariance matrix would change. But something interesting is to check the action of two mode squeezing operator on vacuum stokes. Okay. So if you operate two mode squeezing operator on vacuum stokes, then it would change like this. So you would have your diagonal terms, cos H2R, cos H2R, cos H2R, cos H2R. So there will be four of it, right? It is a four plus two method. And then you will have anti-diagonal terms as well. And the speciality about the speciality about these anti-diagonal terms, remember, so far we have not seen anti-diagonal terms in the covariance matrix. Covariance matrix, right? We didn't see it in any of the cases. But now we see it in the two modes squeezing, two modes squeeze back in, uh, in the covariance matrix of two modes squeeze back in, the anti diagonal terms exist. That means there exists quantum correlation. And it is essentially the characteristic of an ETR state, Einstein to the So all I'm telling you is if you operate two modes, two modes squeezing operator, over a vacuum state, over a you know, two mode vacuum state. So what you will get is an EPR state. Okay, what you will get is an EPR state or Einstein for, for those two things. So using Gaussian quantum optics, Gaussian operator, and Gaussian states, you can generate an entangled state. 
Okay, this is an easy ask. Yeah. So that you can do using a two modes, squeeze back and squeeze. All right. Okay. Uh, any questions? All right. Okay. So maybe I can give you another idea about entanglement here. So here I mentioned that you can use a two mode squeezing operator on two vacuum space, two single mode vacuum space, or a two mode vacuum space to create an entangled space or an EPR space, right? Which you can identify by looking at the anti diagonal or the correlation terms in the two variance packets. But then there is another way to do it as well. And that is the following. You, you take a single mode squeezing. So you take single mode squeezer and vacuum straight, squeeze it in X direction. You take another single mode operation, act it on another vacuum straight, squeeze it in two direction. So you have a squeeze state, a single mode squeeze state, squeeze in X direction, and a single mode squeeze state squeeze in three direction and then you put this two on a beam splitter. So you have two single mode squeeze state put on a beam splitter and then what you get is again a two mode state, right? And this two mode state is nothing but again a PPR state. So you take two single mode squeezing squeeze state and put it on a beam splitter, you get an EPR state or you take a single two mode squeezing operator and put it on a two vacuum states yeah, put, put it on a two mode vacuum state and you get an EPR state. So try to try to you know uh, do the math for this. Okay. So in the math, you have to apply two single mode squeezing operator, one squeezing in X, the other squeezing in P on two different vacuum states, whatever operation, whatever outcome you get. So then you take these two modes and put it on a beam filter. Okay, and then you see the output. And then for the output, you try to draw the covariance matrix, and then you would see that again this are similar matrix. Okay. All right, so, so far we covered the five major Gaussian operations, namely displacement, rotation, um, single mode squeezing, beam splitter, and squeezing operation. Now, maybe we can summarize to using, uh, by, by again revisiting the states. So for every quantum state, every Gaussian quantum state at least, uh, we can write displacement vector, covariance matrix, and this form, which is the representation of the So vacuum, you know, we write it like this. In the fourth case, we can write the catch zero. The covariance matrix is this type, half half in the diagonal, and no off diagonal, of course, because off diagonal kind of talks about entanglement and variation. For the coherence state, this is the displacement vector, this is the covariance matrix, and the fourth state representation is this. So this you can again find in some books. But essentially, the interesting part is a coherent state is a linear superposition over Fox states and or the photon number states. Photon number states are again called Fox states. Squeezed vacuum, the displacement vector looks like this. We already did it, right? E for minus r for x and e for plus r for p. It could also be the other way down. And then, accordingly, your uh, covariance matrix will change e for minus 2r and e for plus 2r in the octagonal, sorry, in the diagonal. Denoting the variances of the two qualities and nothing in the diagonals because that denotes the position. And again, it looks a bit complicated on the fourth basis, but you can we can study this in detail what this means, etc. So essentially, it's a linear combination of only even even put on the space. So two to the power n, right? So it's a linear combination of even put on. And then finally, we have two mode, two mode squeeze state. So two mode squeeze back in space. So Displacement vector would look like this. Cr and Sr here are essentially cos h of r and sin h of r. Okay. Sorry, cos, cos h of r and okay, I have written here r it, but it has to be hr. And then the covariance matrix has to be a four plus four matrix. So if you open this, then so C of 2r here, C 2r here is cos h of 2r and S 2r here is sin h of 2r. And then Z and identity would make this uh, make this a full four plus four matrix. And it again looks 
bit complicated compared to others. So, but but essentially, you can see it's a two mode strip, right? So it has there has to be two gaps for the two different modes. So n photons in mode A and n photons in mode B. So it's superposition of n photons in mode A and n photons in mode B. And you will see that these two are correlated, right? So if in mode A you measure five photons, in mode B you must measure five photons. So you can already see the entanglements from this expression itself. That, that, that was the reason we say two modes speed pattern is an entangled state. Okay. Of course, it is not the bell type of entanglement, it's different, but here it's for NPR type. All right. So, so this is sort of a summary of you know the different operators in the different point states. But uh, I want to go one step forward to give you sort of an idea of where where do we do all these things. So uh, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I just want to ask about that. Uh, we know that co co current state, uh, the product of uncertainty principle, uh, I mean, uh, amplitude and phase have uh, very less uncertainty in the current state and squeeze state also have un very less uncertainty. So what's the difference uh, a current state and squeezing state? Maybe we can say that squeezing state is a one of the part of the coherent state because it's also provide less uncertainty. Yeah, so I think uh, I can recognize it from your voice message. So thank you for the question. So yeah, there's a, there's a very fine difference between coherent state and squeeze state. And that is the following. For coherent state, your delta x and delta p, so the noise in x and the noise in p are same. So coherent state okay. is, is a circle. Okay, it is a circle. Okay, it yes. Could be any, yes. anywhere in the phase space. But a squeeze state, Okay, it's not a circle. It's it's more like an you know like a egg shape or like an oval shape because it is squeezed like, in one uh, like depend on the phase or amplitude you squeeze, right? It, it, exactly, yeah. Depends upon in which direction you are squeezing. But essentially, the delta x and delta p are different, so none of them are going to be half now. One would be less okay. than half, and the other would be more than half. But okay, yes, both. But but yeah, you are correct. Both are minimum uncertainty state. But by what I mean, you know, their product will be like one by root two, one by root two, plus one by two. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So, where do we take these Gaussian operations and you know Gaussian states? Actually, we we want to build technology out of it, right? So Gaussian operations lead to CV quantum groups. So you you might uh, have heard about this company Xanadu, who is trying to make a continuous variable quantum computer. So they essentially exploit this CV quantum office business and also some other groups as well. So using the Gaussian operations, you can hook up CV quantum gates, which leads to your continuous variable quantum computation. So you can see uh, very quickly. I mean, I I want you to explore this thing because this would take maybe another uh, two two more tutorials like this to explain this. But but yeah. You have your computation basis in discrete variable zero one. In continuous variable, we take you know your uh, x values or p values, okay. and accordingly your so your uh, zero one and plus minus basis corresponds to the x and p basis in continuous variable. Okay, uh, and then you you could do different encodings, but essentially you would see there there exist corresponding gates. So your bit flip gate can be replaced with displacement gate. The phase flip gate could be replacement with displacement in P. Hadamard is replaced by Fourier gate, which is again a uh, rotation gate with a particular uh, particular rotation number five by two. And then your CS gate is again another conditional gate. We did not touch uh, touch any of this. I mean displacement. We saw an overall displacement, but you can again make that displacement separate into position and quantum. So essentially, with, with the knowledge that we, we gained in this tutorial for the last uh, sort of couple of hours, uh, you can uh, do the math for these gates now, okay, and see that they directly look similar to, that they, they are similar to the discrete variable standard gates, X, Z, Hadamard, and something more. But there is a catch. Is this sufficient? It's not sufficient. Why it's not sufficient? Because you do not have a quantum advantage until you have a non clifford gate. So what do I mean? In discrete variable quantum computation, in general, in quantum computation, when you read Nielsen and Schwarz, you have a clifford gate set and you have a non clifford gate set. 
So whatever you do using this Clifford gas, so X, Z, H, and C naught, these are all Clifford gas, Clifford, Clifford Z set. Using this, whatever computation you do, it can be also done in a classical way. So there's no quantum advantage. If you want to do something, then you must come up with a non clifford gate, at least one non clifford gate. For example, there's this T gate. This is non clifford Okay. So, or, or I think the Toffoli gate is also non clifford gate. So you have to include a non clifford gate as well. The continuous variable analogous of that is a non Gaussian gate. So, no quantum advantage without a non Gaussian quantum gate is possible. Okay. And which in turn results from a non Gaussian operations. So we, we saw that Gaussian operations lead to this Gaussian gates, right? Uh, if we want to make a non Gaussian gate, then we have to cook up uh, non Gaussian operations, which again needs Hamiltonian expanded in, you know, higher part, power, sorry. They have to be Hamiltonians of X cube, X4, P cube, P4, etc. Because whatever you do with Hamiltonian, uh, with maximum of uh, X square or P square will be a Gaussian. If you want to do a non Gaussian bit, you have to explore the regime of uh, X cube and P cube. So you have to cook up those Hamiltonians, which are pretty hard to do in the lab. So these, these fall in the regime of non linear optics. Again, that's the reason people. People struggle to, to implement non Gaussian operations in non Gaussian states. But yeah, they are of great advantage because they add the quantum advantage to your uh, quantum system. Um, yes, but yeah, people have demonstrated it already. People are uh, doing improvements, and uh, we, we can be assured that in the coming days, there will be non Gaussian operations as well. So essentially, in, even with uh, photonic systems, we will be having non Clifford gates, right? And we'll be having quantum advantages you know, within uh, uh, universal photon type computation. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is not again the part of this lecture. So if you, if you want to take something from this lecture, then uh, take the, the basic structure of Gaussian operations and uh, Gaussian states, uh, the covariance matrices, how the quadrature vector displacement where all this change happens and then you can nicely work in an optics laboratory because working with Gaussian states are easy and later you know if you're interested more then you can uh, explore the regime of non-Gaussian <clears throat> non-Gaussian quantum operations and finally I would like to show you all these references so the first reference Wigner functions and wild transformations so I I, I in the very beginning, right? That I'm not touching with the function. It's, it, you can read it in as detailed as possible, you know, uh, from different sources. But an excellent introduction is this paper, okay, by William B. Case. I strongly encourage you to look at it. Uh, then Gaussian space and operation. So most of the formulas I used in this uh, lecture are from this. So this is a sort of condensed lecture note. And then it's uh, this paper by Wiesbro. By the way, Wiesbro is the founder of Zenodo Quantum uh, uh, Photonic Quantum Computing Company. And he wrote this article. And of course, then he made a, a whole company out of Gaussian quantum information. So you, you, you should read this paper if you are fascinated by Gaussian quantum uh, it's, it's a detailed review, of course. It's, it's probably in your monitor. <clears throat> Then there's a not just not so updated because it's published in 2019, but it still talks about all the progress in continuous variable quantum technology. This is continuous variable quantum computing means, but really not in the overall technology. But then you see the difficulty in non Gaussian operations, what what level of Gaussian operations we have accomplished so far, what are the issues in them, what are the areas to improve on. And then finally, this paper by Zenedu again last year, where they demonstrated the state of the art results in Gaussian quantum optics and using them for you know, uh, quantum computing. And they showed an advantage, and you would see how they have shown an advantage uh, even, uh, just by using Gaussian states uh, in this paper. But, but just to give you a hint, 
there is something non gaussian in this paper that we will see because otherwise they, they can't claim a quantum mechanism. And then a few books. These are some of my favorite books. So if you want, if you are if you are a person who would like to uh, get more of intuition without getting into more of math, then I would recommend Mark Fox. If you want to look at both of it, then quantum optics. But uh, Gary and Knight quantum optics, the second one. But it's it's a bit advanced, I would say, in terms of notations. And then the last one. This is, I would say, this is sort of the bible of optical quantum information for optical. This is not a famous book, but yeah, I wonder why it's not famous because it discusses about many things: continuous variable quantum computing, measurement based quantum computing, CV systems, also compared to DV systems, but all in the optical region, but also atomic and solid systems as well. So this is an excellent book again. Um, so yeah, I think I have been talking for quite quite long. So that's it from my side. I'll be happy to take some final questions before we wind up. And yeah. Uh, thank you very much for all your questions. Bearing me, a lot of text, a lot of equations, a lot of jargons, blah blah. But yeah, I can take up some questions if you have. Uh, thanks again, Shoji Raya, for this wonderful uh, interview session. If someone has question and uh, confusion, uh, can ask. We have few minutes left. So, is there any question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, you can speak. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thanks for that uh, very pedagogical presentation. Um, my question is that, uh, I mean, as far as I know that nobody has managed to implement the GKP code in uh, an optical system. Um, is, is, that, is that true as of now? Uh, yes, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. okay. And uh, like, I mean, what is the, why is it so difficult? Uh, do you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, actually. Um, so GKP state is, again, a non-Gaussian state. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned, to, to construct a non-Gaussian state, you have to explore a Hamiltonian, which is, you know, of cubic order or higher. So you have to work with, you know, high level of non-linearity. And this non-linearity is missing, not missing. I mean, it is hard to generate in optics and sonic systems. In superconducting systems, it's rather easier to cook up non-linearity, you know, using Dosha conjunctions and uh, uh, kinetic indu inductance, etc. But with, uh, uh, quantum optic systems with optics and photonics, we don't have, you know, access to that level of nonlinearity that we can explore Hamiltonians of uh, cubic powers of x and t to to generate, you know, non-Gaussian operations of you know, non-Gaussian operations like GKP state set. Um, no, so so nobody has implemented like an optical phase state, for example. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think no. People have, I think, proposed. Um, yeah, I think people have proposed. Uh, there's a group on. There's a group in Sweden. Okay, Chalmers University. So they have proposed. They regularly propose different protocols. Also, Japanese group, Kurosawa group, my previous group, they have also proposal. But to the best of my knowledge, no, nobody has implemented a cubic phase gate as well. Uh, which, yeah, I mean, a deterministic cubic phase, right? They might have some conditional things, et cetera, but that's not, you know, not even a real cubic phase gate. Because if you have a cubic phase gate, then you can also prepare sort of a GKP state. If you have a GKP state, then you can easily prepare a cubic phase gate. Okay. So, so this kind of thing, is, you know, this kind of proposals exist there. So because cubic phase gate is, again, a non gaussian gate. A non -gaussian gate. So, yeah, the I think... The phase gate is the main obstacle. Sorry? The cubic gate, the phase gate is the main obstacle. It's not a phase, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so e to the power, you know, i in x cube, all right, the cubic phase gate is, again, the main obstacle here. People haven't been able to generate, generate it. <clears throat>
Uh, can I ask one more question? Yeah, sure. Um, so you have shown some textbooks. Uh, there is one textbook that I hear about a lot uh, by Ulf Leonhard, uh, the mm -hmm. quantum state of light. Uh, are you familiar yeah. with that? Is that what, like how, why did you not mention that? I mean, isn't that like a classic or something? Yeah, so it's like, you know, it, it's a classic textbook of quantum optics. Okay, for sure. But it's again old. So you might not get some references to recent works there. But yeah, I mean, it, it's just like reading the quantum mechanics book by, um, I would say reading a quantum mechanics book by Griffith or reading Dirac's quantum mechanics book. Right. So something like that. I see. I see. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is it possible to contact you by mail? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I haven't dropped my. I can I can put my email ID in the chat here. But I'm also ready to meet them on LinkedIn. So you are welcome to write to me there. Okay, LinkedIn is fine. Yeah, I've also dropped my email here uh, in the chat box. Yeah. Um. Can I ask a question? Uh, first of all, thank you for delivering a nice tutorial. Uh, could you please inform in which book paper I can find the comparison table between discrete and uh, continuous variable states? Uh, yes. Yeah, I also saw your chat. So this paper I mentioned, uh, this uh, this uh, towards large scale fault tolerant universal computing. Okay. okay, this paper, and also the the references therein. And also in this book, you will find, you know, the comparison between D and C. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Uh, is there any other question? Someone else? Uh, I have a, a small question. Uh, uh, can you also tell me that reference that uh, that can uh, differentiate between the like you mentioned that uh, quantum uh, information theory like we use the, some class quantum gates like hard mod uh, control node gates but in q modes it's very different it's a little bit like unfamiliar i don't know what is exactly that one so can you just tell me the uh, some reference book so i can uh, just uh, go to uh, quantum information theory to quantum modes. I mean, Q modes, yeah. a gate that, mm -hmm. that we are using in quantum optics. So, so this is the book, Optical Quantum Information Processing. So it nicely distinguishes okay. between qubits operations and Q modes operations. But yeah, just remember that in this book, they call Q naught, Q naught, Q U N A T, Q nets instead of okay. Q modes. I don't know for what reason, but yeah. That's what they do. But yeah, this is an excellent book for that. Okay, thanks. Welcome. I guess there's no more questions. I also think so. So thanks again, uh, George Baya. And uh, thanks all, also thanks to all participants for attending this session. Uh, so now we are concluding this uh, tutorial session here and uh, so and all participants are requested to attend the next session. Our next session will start from 6 p.m. and there will be two speakers. Uh, so please join the next session. And yeah, so th thank you once again to everybody. Uh, it's, it's excellent to talk to an audience of 70, 90, 100 numbers. I really enjoy the questions and yeah, I really appreciate that. And thank you. Yes, and uh, one more announcement is uh, the, tutor, the note of the uh, tutorial session will be available on our website soon. So you people can find over there. Uh, thanks again. And okay, Tada. See you in the next session. See you, Samuel. All the best. Thank you.